But you guys cleared the extra stage already! What the hell's this? What if I told you the story's still not over yet? After the battle with Ran, she and the heroine reconciled for the latter to come back at night for she was certain her master would be awake by then. So ultimately, and I hate to say this, I really do, but that last fight served no purpose! Yuyuko, why?! But that's okay, because we're back to take care of things for good! So while we zip through the same path we did before, trust me, it's virtually the same, let's talk about Phantasm. Phantasm is widely considered the next step up from Extra. The bullet patterns are faster, thicker, and overall even more intimidating. A stage in particular is a staple among the player's ultimate accomplishments, because to even play this stage, they first have to clear Extra, and Ron doesn't make that easy. After that, they have to capture a total of 60 spell cards. Only then will Phantasm will be available to play. But join her, you say, put off a little, about the number 60. There aren't even that many spells in the game. Oh, but there are. You see, each spell has four variations, one for each difficulty. For instance, Yuyuko's Resurrection Butterfly on Normal is a different spell from Resurrection Butterfly on any of the other difficulties. This also encourages play on those levels. I like that. And Ran is here to block us off once again. Here's my question. Why? We've already beaten her once. Aren't we obligated by way of the spell card rules to see her master right off the bat? Or is it one of those, not if I can help it, kind of things? And the answer would be that the spell card rules do allow for rematches, which I suppose is why Ran is asking for another battle. Because she thinks we cheated the first time. We're only human after all. Fun fact. Even though she says she's tired, Dran has been shown to be the only mid-boss in the series that is completely immune to bombs. Have fun! Other than that, her patterns are similar to that of Chen, so if you've gotten through it once, you can get through it again. I have faith in you. Back to Phantasm. This is to date the one and only Phantasm stage in the history of the Toho series. That is, the only official one meaning the others that you might have seen around if you are curious enough to look are only fan-made replications made with a scriptwriter called Don Makufu, which as far as I know allow you to program your own spell cards, stages, layouts, etc. I don't know who made it, but I do know it got the fans a lot more involved with the series because everyone loves making their own version of things. It's a great and common way to get involved, share ideas, etc. I would get into examples of this, but that would be sequence breaking and I'd rather not do that just yet. Let's go over their inspirations first. Maybe I'll even cover a few fan games in the future, creators willing. Now, as much as a fight Ran put up just then, there are a number of people that insist that this Phantasm stage is actually easier than the extra stage. I'm not really seeing it myself, but at the same time, I'm not quite on their level yet, so I can't prove them wrong or anything. Maybe it's another one of those memorization sequences, or maybe they consulted a strategy video or something like that. I just find it odd that a later level would be considered easier than a prior level, but I guess it does happen even to me from time to time. And then we come across the rainbow puzzle again, only this time it's got two more parts. But Rock still manages to navigate it like a boss. I gotta ask him how he does that, it's almost robotic the way he does. But anyway, after finishing that last bit, we are finally on our way to confronting the true last boss of this game the master of the Yakumo family, and the mastermind behind all of the prior events. I'm gonna have fun explaining this one, and if you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. I find myself not needing to drag this on any longer because she's so well known. I am of course talking about Yukata Yakumo. It's going to take me a fair bit to find the words necessary to describe Yukari's behavior, and that's because she is just that often an anomaly to everyone around her, and sometimes completely unpredictable and impossible to find. So we just assume she's quote-unquote fooling around most of the time. This isn't to say Yukari's a fool. Even she has her reasons for doing what she does. We just don't understand them is all. So we could also say the more intelligent the character in question is, the less accurate my commentary is going to be. But I'll try my best. As Ran's master, she boasts an even higher level of strength and intelligence than Ran herself, who I already consider to be very smart and powerful, so I can't even consider the possibility. But it's there. She also wields the ability to manipulate boundaries, an ability which, when you take the time to think about it, it's incorporated in every pair of opposites. 
The sky and the ground, left and right, reality and fiction, life and death. I could keep going. She could twist it, blur it, or remove it completely. And that's extremely dangerous. Imagine a world in which we couldn't listen to music or concentrate for an upcoming exam because the boundary between noise and silence was rubbed out. Then you'll have neither, or both, if you can wrap your mind around that. I can, for instance. She can also open up boundaries of her own in any given area and pass through it as easily as taking a stroll to the bathroom. This can be used as a means of travel, or for simple cases of unsuspecting theft, or even for stepping into the outside world for a bit, making her one of the very few characters that can. Even though I said it like that and made it sound like she was the strongest character ever, on par with gods of another realm, that isn't the case. Yukari is still a yokai, and as such, even as that, that, and as such, even she can still be outclassed. Though for her to be that mighty anyway says something about the power of gods, it's truly incomprehensible. On top of that, she sleeps. A lot. Typically through all of winter and most of the day for the rest of the year. So even if you supposedly did live in Gensokyo, you're gonna have a hard time finding her. Much less finding, quote, somewhere along the boundary, which is where she's, supp where she's said to live. That's like catching a party full of Feebas in Ruby and Sapphire. One is hard enough to find, good luck getting the sixth when you have no more useful Pokemon. When she is awake, however, she is a Pandora's box full of deviousness, whim, and fickleness, I tell you what. She's got this air of mischief about her, and combined with aforementioned ability to open up boundaries just about anywhere and cross through them, she is virtually always suspected of something, whether it be by the other characters or even by the fans. In spite of this, she always has Gensokyo's best interests at heart. She just has a funny way of showing it, to the point where she doesn't even really care about what barrage of bullets she's going to use next, and will even go so far as to lose a duel on purpose. Now, Yukari's been around for much, much longer than Gensokyo's even existed. She's, she was recorded in history archives dating back to roughly 1200 years ago under some sort of different moniker. What it is, no one has a clue. But she continues to show up in these records, and quite a number of times, too. You'll see this as we progress through the rest of TP-101. No, that doesn't stand for toilet paper. Anyway, for instance, she is implied to have assisted in the creation of the boundaries surrounding Gensokyo. She waged a full-scale war against people living on the moon. She played item recognition with the owner of Korindo several times, and whenever she's awake, she occasionally harasses the other residents, most notably Reimu. But most of those are for future videos, I'm sure. Personal opinion time. In Yukari, I see a very magnificent and mysterious appearance. She's sly and cunning, and she always knows how to get her way, eventually. Some might call Mary Sue on that, but then consider it's the same personality that leads her to being suspected most of the time. And she ends up fighting unnecessary fights. On top of that, remember that I said she's not even the most powerful character. There's also this, fla there's also this phrase going around that... Nah, 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 I can't even really understand. Yukari is 17 years old. I pretty much ignore this because one, despite her young appearance and portrait art, Perfect Memento tells us this clearly not true, and two, 17 years old isn't even legal here in the West. If they had said 21 years old, that would have been a different story, and I wouldn't have found it as pointless. But you know people, they're always tempted to want what they can't have. That's a part of why people steal cars and perform bank heists. Maybe Yukari is an embodiment of temptation, or wanting to be what you are in herself, without actually meaning to be. That's what she reminds me of, at least. Or maybe I just made that connection right now. You'll never know. Ha 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 And so finally, we reach the final, absolute final portion of this story of shrine maidens and regular magicians, and time-stopping combat maids and season irregularities, and spell cards that threaten to crush us within walls within walls of bullets. Once again, thank you to the people that had their replays available for use for this portion of Toho Project 101. That is Nanotech for Stages 1 and 5, Zero Gravity Alpha 1 for Stage 2, Sick 07 for Stage 3, Kanako VOWG for Stage 6, and Rock for the Phantasm Stage Replay. And ultimately, we got nothing accomplished after all. Sometimes things just refuse to go the way you want them to, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time when we go over immaterial and missing power. Wait, we?
Yes, we. Oui.